The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. This Australian Investors Podcast episode is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, use the coupon code RASK and secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. We're proud to have the Intelligent Investor as an ongoing supporter of the Australian Investors podcast. As a result, RASK does not earn a volume-based fee. Simply head to intelligentinvestor.com.au or use the link in your podcast player to access your free trial. This episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is also proudly supported by SelfWealth, Australia's leading independent broker. Over 120,000 investors trust SelfWealth with over $9 billion in equities. With SelfWealth, you can trade ASX, US, and Hong Kong listed shares for a flat fee. On a $10,000 investment with Comsec, you'd pay $29.95 in fees. Yet with SelfWealth, it's just $9.50. The thing I like about SelfWealth is the full access to fundamental company data and how easy it is to trade US, Hong Kong, and Aussie shares in one place. You can see your Apple shares and ACDC ETF right beside each other. To join SelfWealth now, use the link in your podcast player or head to selfwealth.com.au and use the coupon code RASK during sign-up. Thanks for tuning in to today's podcast. Please remember that all of the information in this podcast episode is limited to general information only. That means the information is not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So you should seek the advice of a licensed and trusted financial professional before acting on the information. And before you acquire or apply for a financial product, please read the PDS or product disclosure statement, which should be available on the issuer's website. Lastly, please keep in mind that past performance is not indicative of future performance. Andrew Page, back for round two of this stock pitch episode of the Australian Investors Podcast, mate. It's great to have you with me. Yeah, mate. Always always a pleasure to chat. Last time we spoke about Pointera, which is a very small um, software business. Today, we're talking about another business, which is also in software, but quite a bit larger and also does some hardware. Before we get to that, um, for those people who have followed along with Strawman, uh, maybe they have an account, maybe they're active users, maybe they haven't joined yet. Um, you've got a bit of a, I guess, something to get excited about on the platform. Um, you're running a bit of a competition, which I'll let you introduce. And it's kind of just free upside for people who want to participate. Yeah, we're really excited about it. A lot of people will be familiar with the ASX share market trading game. Um, and so we're taking a leaf out of their book, except we're doing it on a far more sophisticated platform with, 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 <laughs> with, 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 with a lot more discretion for you. So yeah. Already on Strawman, everyone get, gets given $100,000 in play money mm-hmm. and you can build a sample portfolio uh, there. Uh, one, to build a public track record, but also to signal to the other members what you think is worth holding. And that's what helps determine all of our rankings, um, uh, et cetera. So what we wanted to do is, 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 is run a competition. Um, and it's, uh, it's in partnership with, with Ausbiz and Think Markets. It's called the Strawman Classic. We want to do this on a regular basis. But this first one we're going to, uh, we're kicking off, it's, it's a $10,000 prize pool. So what we want to do, obviously, we, we think it'll, it'll sort of introduce and attract a lot of people to Strawman, but we're out there to, to help find the best private investors in Australia. 
um, and, and shine a bit of a spotlight on them and give them the recognition um, and reward that they deserve. So we're really, we're really excited about it. So jump on, check it out. Yeah. And there's a prize pull up for grabs. So for people that um, want to participate in this classic for eight weeks, please go ahead. Um, at full disclosure, I have an interest in, in straw man and I'd love to see Andrew succeed with the platform because I think it's such a great thing. So um, I'm all about it. You'll find links in the show notes for this episode. But enough of games, Andrew. Let's talk about a company. Let's talk about a company that people know that you are on record talking about, which is the mighty Catapult. And it trades on the ASX under the stock ticker code CAT, C-A-T. Tell us a bit about it, mate. I, I imagine most listeners understand loosely what it does, but maybe you can just fill in for those that don't. Yeah, a lot of people will be familiar with it. And a lot of people have a pretty negative opinion of it because it's got a bit of a checkered history. Yep. And I've been involved in this. I think I bought my first shares in this back in 2017 or something like that. And it's been a wild ride, adding more and taking some off the table over that period. But it's done me very, very well. And it's gotten to a point, particularly earlier this year, where it was just phenomenal buying opportunity. But I still think there's a bit of value there, to, there today. So um, these guys are uh, sports analytics. You'll Anyone who's a fan of sport probably has... Um, seen their product you often see players with a little square device in the, in the between their shoulder blades and stuff and this tracks anything that you know speed momentum hits you know height everything and so it's used to it's used to monitor the it's very much for elite um, athletes so so um, top top grades of, of echelons of sport and it just allows athlete, um, managers and coaches and trainers and that to really optimize training maximize on-field time for their star players and just manage coaching and all of this kind of stuff. So it's, mm. it's just, it's just bringing data to the decision-making process, which is always good, but data on itself is, is not, is not great. It actually brings a lot of smarts and um, interpretive um, uh, insight to that data as well. Mm. So they, they're huge. They've got 3000 teams across 39 different sports you know, most of their money is coming out of the US. But, you know, the, the, the kind of people using Catapult, it's Real Madrid, uh, it's the Wallabies, it's St Kilda, it's, you know, all of the biggest teams in the biggest leagues around the world are, are, are using this. So it's now, uh, today, a company with $100 million in revenue. And it's come a long way since it was um, listed in, I, I want to say... Uh, it's 2014, I think. 2014. It came out of the Australian Institute of Sports mm. originally. Um, founded in 2006, run as a private company for a while. Yeah, then listed at, at 50 cents a share. And since then, I mean, in the last few years, sales have, well, sales have been growing very strongly for, for a long time. Um, I think they were only 60 million um, a few years ago. And now they're at 100 million. So mm. growing, growing really rapidly, very big addressable market. The genuine world leader that's out there. But as I say, a bit of a shaky past, uh, which maybe we can get into later. Yeah, I think the one number that I kind of um, am drawn to with regards to tracking the performance of the business from IPO to now is um, in the US, where are my numbers? Um, da, 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 here we go. So $100 million of revenue today, $77 million in um, subscription revenue, so recurring revenue, which is something that we always like to see. Um, but the business, you know, it has customer durations now of six and a half years. Um, it's gone from, I think it was $1 million US of revenue from the US at IPO to something like 60 million plus now, which is a huge amount of revenue um, and growth that you can kind of illustrate that trajectory over in the States. Um, the, the business has morphed over time, Andrew, and this is where we talk about opportunity and execution. And sometimes it's harder to get a handle on execution, at least, um, I guess, in advance. And one of the moves that they tried to make was a push from not only professional sports into a segment of the market, which they called prosumer. Prosumer. Prosumer, mm -hmm. yeah, air quotes, where you would effectively, you could, you know, I, you or I could go down the street and get one of these and, and chuck it on and pretend, you know, how are we tracking like whatever athlete we're trying to, I guess, be like. And Well, I'm not going to put myself in the prosumer <laughs> category, maybe you, but yeah, it, it is more, more for the sort of the, this, the below professional athlete. Yeah, yeah. So that kind of semi-pro, you know, aspiring athlete that's still good, but, you know, trying to get up there. And I think that was as 
you know, time has showed that is probably, that was a poor use of capital effectively because there was so much opportunity already in the pro sports segment. And one of the things that Catapult did over time is it, is it took away from just being a hardware, kind of put this thing in the back of your, 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 your top and, and run around and get tracked via GPS to more software, more video and more analytics. So they've kind of built out this full stack. Mm. Sometimes that takes time, right? It, it takes, <laughs> it always takes longer than you think. Um, uh, absolutely. And, and, you, and very often, uh, I think it's hard to think of a company that hasn't had missteps. I mean, even Apple, go, yeah. you know, they, 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 they venture into fields that, that often end up destroying shareholder capital. And prosumer was very much that. They tried to do too much too soon. They saw a wonderful opportunity. And it, it's easy to look back in hindsight and say, what a dumb move. But I mean, look at the time, prosumer is a very big market. They've got very good brand Absolutely. recognition in the elite sports um, area. They've got all of this technology that they can use. Like it just seemed really obvious. Let's go for this as well. It's a, it's a, it just, it just magnifies our total addressable market by a huge amount, but for a number of reasons, they didn't execute well. And at the same time, so as long as it's been listed, I mean, the top line has been growing. It's sort of circa 20% year on year on year, just phenomenal top line growth. Mm. But what put a lot of people's noses out of joints is that say, uh, costs were rising just as quickly. <laughs> They're not profitable, um, even though even though you know sales have virtually doubled in the last three or four years. Um, and this was another expense and another distraction that that sort of came in there. So it turned to be a, it turned, it was it was a poor move, and they've now since pulled back from that. Mm. And sometimes, I'm not saying that this is the direct impact of a CEO or what have you, but um, in recent times, we've seen a new CEO and Will Lopes uh, brought in. Uh, I think he came from Audible, which is a subsidiary of Amazon, I believe. And then he's been revenue officer there for years. Yeah, yeah, right. So he understands brand marketing and the US market. And mm. then you've brought in, he's brought in Chris Cooper, another guy that he worked with, who's now the chief operate, operating officer of Catapult. Mm -hmm. So lots of experience with that fast growth, innovative tech company um, space. And I think the thing that, really stood out to me in the recent results, Andrew. And this, keep in mind, was at a time when almost all uh, sporting codes around the world ground to a halt. There was, there was no sport for a matter of weeks, in some instances, sometimes months, and many were cancelled. And what they came out and said was um, they gave a preview of their full year earnings and they said free cash flow was $9 million, up from negative $15 million a year before so they've all of a sudden just twisted and shift into this inflection point with, with cash flows. And they've done that by a combination of cutting costs and reducing spending where it was probably not necessary. And then also that recurring revenue has just been ratcheting up in the background. So I feel like if I'm looking at this from the outside, it's almost hitting scale mm -hmm. uh, in, in spite of what we're seeing in, in sporting markets. Would you agree with that? Yes. I mean, there's some tent this has always been the thing that I've been looking for is to sort of hit that inflection point and sustainably grow profitability um, without additional capital, um, maintain that top line growth, but then introduce some cost discipline and allow that cash to drip through to, to, um, to the business. Um, so I think they're there. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it done yet. There's, there's a little no. bit more water to go under the bridge. I mean, you can, you, you could take a backward step here, but it is very encouraging. And I think, you know, at the start of this year, shares were at two bucks and COVID hit and shares dropped down to close to 50 cents at one stage because yep. people thought, well, sports not happening. Um, what a wonderful opportunity. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's one of these things. I think you, 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 you gain such an advantage by having a long-term familiarity with this business, with any business, and you're able to contextualize a lot of this stuff. So it was always going to be, we live in a, we live in a complex world. It, it's, it's not just this, it's bad, it's good. You know, it's like there are always negatives and their COVID was a massive negative for them. And it's still going to impact this year in terms of their, their particularly their capital sales. It's really, mm. really hit them. But you've got to remember a business is, is best, the value of a business is best defined as the total value of all of its, its future cash flows. So even if you have a terrible couple of years, as long as the longer term looks good, there's, there's still going to be value there. Um, and what was interesting as well is that it turns out that retention was super high over that yeah. period because all of these sporting bodies who pay millions of dollars for these assets, i.e. the players, wanted to keep them fit 
wanted to make sure that they were still training, wanted to do all of this, but had to do it remotely. So they, they actually introduced some, some more features for that to sort of assist and all that. And it turned out to be more robust than I think a lot of people had, had given them credit for. Yeah. And this is an instance, uh, an example of how they kind of innovated and delivered value to players in a remote setting. You know, they introduced some proximity tracking so you could see how close players were to each other. Obviously, during COVID, we have social distancing. Well, yeah. you still want players to train and do all that. Well, how close were they and where were they this time and that time? Um, they did in-home training solutions via an app so that the coaches could, you know, push that out to players. They also had wellness. So they brought in this kind of functionality where, you know, coaches could kind of, again, push that out to players and, and to the team and to, to keep and maintain that momentum. Because like you said, for those of you who track soccer, I'm a big soccer um, nut, you could call me, Andrew. And for those who track soccer, you would have heard recently that the numbers being put on Lionel Messi's, um, I guess, time for the next three years was around about 700 million pounds, I believe. So you're looking at massive, massive assets and hugely valuable to these teams. If they can get an edge, if they can spend $10,000, $50,000, whatever it might be, just to get the slightest edge, they will spend it. And I think that was illustrated in COVID where they were out of action, but it was still so important for them to maintain momentum. Yeah. And I think there was kind of a bittersweet thing here, Andrew, where the company was forced to cut costs and then they owe, they didn't cut costs so aggressively that it damaged the business materially, I would say, but they cut enough to then say, we don't need to keep cutting anymore. It's actually yeah, not that, that bad. And they were doing it before COVID. So, so, so the, the big criticism of the, of the previous management team was very poor cost discipline. The board finally got the message on that. Will Lopez has been very Lopes. Lopez. Uh, Lopes never met him. Um, uh, uh, he keenly understands that, mm. and um, yeah, I, I think I think so. When COVID hit, they'd already gone through a lot of the process of cost cutting and could accelerate that. So I put them in. The timing was very good for them there, and they needed to do that. Yeah, and one thing. So I spoke to. Um, we're very fortunate that some of our members at RASC are actually former AFL players or current AFL players. And cool. yeah. some of them said to me that they were using this technology five or 10 years ago. And it was, there's no, there are competitors. We know they're competitors, but there was yeah. no one that came close to them at the time. They generally had a head start on this. And um, what I thought was really interesting is that a lot of people were saying, you know, sports are done, you know, and we see this huge surge in esports. all of a sudden people playing video games and that's a huge thing in itself. Yeah. But what we, what people tend to forget is a lot of these um, sporting codes actually have private companies or individuals owning them. So these are businesses and whether or not the league slows down or not, they still have investments to recoup in these teams and they're going to keep spending because they know it's profitable to do. And even like we talk about the AFL here in Australia that had, because it was Melbourne centric before COVID, obviously Melbourne shut down. There was a lot of issues there. Well, I thought there's so many options for the league. It's not as if this thing's going away forever. It might just be a hiatus from Melbourne or pause or whatever. Yes. Things might get damaged, but longer term, everything is still in play. Mate, it, there are some, you know, our job is forecasting the future, right? And there are some things that, geez, it, the future is always foggy. But if there's one thing I'm going to bet my left arm on is that sports <laughs> will be around in the future and they will be, they will have a massive market. It, it has been with us since gladiatorial times. It'll be with us for, for a long, long, long time. But it's like religion, right? It's not going to die. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Hey, you touched on a point before where you talked about the future value of cash flows. Sometimes when I read some of your writing, whether it's on straw man or elsewhere, um, you talk about valuation and I know you talk about it as being generally correct rather than specifically right and um, or specifically wrong rather. Um, when I read a lot of your writing, you talk about internal rates of return and getting to the bottom of how you value these smaller companies. Is it pure discounted cash flow analysis that you use or are you using more of a hybrid of IRR, so internal rate of returns based on earnings or something like that? It's a really good question. You know, so I've, it's been a real journey for me from way back in the early days of just looking at a PE mm -hmm. to getting more advanced with DCFs and the rest of it. And I've got to tell you, as, like, as time goes on, I'm trending back to the more simplified approaches. DCF modeling is, is um, 
obviously extremely valuable, but the old saying is garbage in, garbage out. And, and it is a model that requires you to make forecasts on a whole range of different things. Mm. Sales growth is hard to anticipate, but then margins and everything, it, it's, it, is, it is tricky. And when, when do things start to slow down and, and all of this kind of stuff? I find it a really useful process in building a model, not so much to come up again with the definitive um, idea of value, although that's, that's important, but it shows you how things change when you pull on various levers. It, gets, it gives you a real insight into what are the key things that this business needs to do to, to sort of justify value. But I think, I think, um, and it's harder too. So DCFs are, are wonderful, but you know, for a company that's perhaps pre-profit, um, maybe even pre-sale, it's, it's just, it's just, you can get so sophisticated with this and you can have this huge Excel spreadsheet that sort of looks super fancy on that, but it's, it, there is so many guesses on guesses on guesses and, and they, they leverage on top of it. You get these very, you get, you can make a DCF say whatever you want it to say. Um, so I think that there's definite value there in going through the process, but, but I, I, I often these days it's, it's, it's much more simplified than that as a, as a, as, especially with the kind of companies that, that you and I often um, focus on, which is so small cap, fast growing companies where it's just a matter of saying, listen, do I think this company can, can, do I think catapult can sustain sort of circa 20% growth over the next five years? Yes. What kind of net margins does a company like this typically operate on? Or what would I assume for that? And that's going to give, you know, how many shares are on issue? And all of a sudden in five years time, I've got an EPS forecast mm. without having to have a lot of guesses. And then I can just sort of say, well, what does the market tend to pay for a company like this growing at these rates? And, you know, who knows what, what market multiples are going to be. But if, if you can put in a value that doesn't require a high level of sentiment, at that time for you to realize a good game. Um, you, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can then get to a target price and you can discount that back to today. It's very hard to do this verbally, but, but I guess what I'm saying is I'm trying to look at the bigger themes and then trace back, trace back um, an idea of value from that without having to, to get you know, specific on every single line item in an income statement. Mm. I find that's particularly with these faster growing companies, um, it's very hard to determine. I've seen some DCFs from investors that have a 10 year forecast um, window. And then in, in year nine is when it turns to free cash flow positive and they put a value on it. Yeah. And I think that, that that's, that's just, that's, uh, that, that, that doesn't make sense. I can't compute that, but I still see that type of behavior. And I, I often come back to, and that might be right. You know, there's nothing that might be right. It might be free cash flow positive in year nine, oh. but what I keep coming back to with a lot of these fast growing small caps is using a kind of that, that earnings per share multiple as kind of like an earnout figure, kind of like a private investor or private equity manager would with an asset. You know, you start today, what's the earnings per share? Do you get in dividends in between? And then just compute the IRR on that and then determine from there, is that a reasonable expected return for this business? And then play around with the inputs to get some sort of scenarios. Yep. I keep coming back to that with these smaller growth companies. And I think it's, some people can get a bit, I guess, mystified by valuing these faster growth companies. And yes, you can do it however you like. That's just what we're talking about. This is the way we, we're doing it. But I think this is a simpler, uh, I guess, more intuitive way to value these growth companies. And I thought I'd just tuck that on the end of this conversation, Andrew, because it's one of those areas where you're looking at a business, it's fast growing. How do you put a value on it? How do you even get close to putting a value on it? And that's kind of what you what we talk about. I'll put some links in the show notes. We've done some tutorials on this in the past. Yeah. But Andrew, if you're looking at Catapult today, just to summarize, are you excited about the future or how are you seeing it? I am. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that the worst of, of COVID is behind us and that these, these um, leagues will, will all start up again in, in a much more serious form. Longer term, I'm, I'm convinced that that's the case. These guys, as you say, there's obviously there's competitors out there, but they're, they're the genuine global leader here. They've got mm. huge um, reference uh, customers that they can point to. I think one of the things that's really nice, I talked last week, the last time we chatted about sort of structural changes. And this, this, is, this is a structural change uh, in this industry. You know, the, the, the way that we're monitoring um, athletes is, is changing. And whether it's catapult or not, I, again, I will bet my left arm that in the future, every sports has some kind of um, remote monitoring and analytics around it. it. It just, 
it, it's it's a it's a guarantee, and they're very well positioned to do that. Yeah. So so there's there's a lot of potential for them to upsell there, and and in fact that was really encouraging in the most recent set of results is that you you are seeing seeing that that increased spend. So it's not just winning more clients. It's 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 having those clients use more of your product. And they're also very focused on league wide deals, which is anyone in this league is using our product, which are really big. And I think what, what I'm really like about catapult is I like any business that benefits from network effects. Mm. I think it's one of the most potent moats that you can get out there. That is the idea that your product becomes more valuable, the more people that use it. And I think that's very true for catapult. It's true because the more data that you're collecting, the, the more advantage you have in future development. I mean, look at, look at uh, Google and Facebook. It's very hard to capture those, catch those guys because, because of, of the informational advantage that they have in terms of developing and enhancing their own, their own uh, offerings. So that's true. There's often a lot of trading that goes on at the elite sports level as well. The data is all owned by Catapult. People will take that with them. So um, there, is, there is very, very potent network effects there. So my, my long-winded, long-winded answer, but my, my, my future vision is, is that um, this, is a, this, this is a company that I think can sustain very high top line growth for many years. And I think with some cost discipline here, we will finally get past that inflection point and see not only very high sales growth, but an even faster profit growth off the base of that. And then hopefully the market will start to value this a bit more appropriately and a bit more in line with what you might see as typical with other sort of SaaS oriented businesses. Mm. So it's not the value that it once was, but as, as I have, as I am living <laughs> proof, you know, I bought this thing at first at 55 cents and then I sold it to 20 and then you, you get these opportunities when the market goes from just ridiculously cheap to ridiculously expensive. Again, not to try and time entry and exit points, but just, sensibly adjusting your weighting relative to the value that you perceive. Mm. But today I, I still think it's there. If you jump on the straw man, you can look at my, my company report for catapult. I think the valuation I have is about 260 at the moment, which I think is about fair for the stock. Mm. Great. I think that's a, a, a fine way to, to end the conversation, mate. Andrew page from straw man, as always, thanks for taking the time out, mate. A pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thanks mate. Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF, or ASX JEPI, J-E-P-I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion dollars as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.